Hello, everyone. We hope that you're keeping well and, and staying safe wherever you are. Welcome to the launch of IFPRI's 2020 Global Food Policy Report. I'm Rajul Pandya Loach, Director of Communications and Public Affairs at IFPRI, and I'll be moderating this event. Our flagship report provides perspectives on major food policy issues, developments, and opportunities. This year's report highlights the critical role that inclusive food systems can play in improving nutrition, creating employment and income generating opportunities and increasing empowerment of disadvantaged groups. Thank you for joining our first virtual event. And thank you to those of you who are watching this recording after the event. We're eager to hear from you and to participate in the Q&A session that will follow the presentations, please submit your questions using the chat box. You can also join the conversation on our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn using the hashtag GFBR2020. We have an exciting program lined up for you, and we'd like to call on Yo Swinnan, Director General of IFPRI, who will present a brief introduction now and will then return later in the program to share his perspectives. Yo, over to you. Thank you very much, Rajul. And welcome everybody to this unusual uh, launch of the Global Food Policy Report, which is titled Building Inclusive Food Systems. Food systems provide opportunities to improve food and nutrition security, to generate income, and to drive inclusive economic growth. But even in prosperous times and prosperous societies, too many people are still excluded from fully participating in food systems and securing these benefits. And of course, it's worse in developing countries. In times of crisis like today, inclusion is an even greater imperative for protecting the most vulnerable. Our report has 12 chapters, which are lined out in the next uh, slide. So the first six chapters are really about different themes and they focused, four of the chapters focus particularly on groups which are often excluded from food systems. These include smallholder farmers, youth, women, refugees and conflict affected people. The sixth chapter focus explicitly on national food systems because it is really important to look at the local implementation of some of our policies and recommendations. We also have six regional chapters in uh, the report and those will be presented at a future event uh, in the coming weeks. I will now give the floor to our three speakers who will cover three of these uh, system-wide system uh, issues. One, uh, John will talk about national systems, Laura will talk about gender issues, and Rob will talk about smallholder integration in food systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe, for your introductory remarks and for introducing our three speakers. So let me turn over to our first speaker, John McDermott, who is director of the CGIR Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, who will share perspectives from the chapter on national food systems. John, over to you. Thank you, Rajul, and welcome everyone. Sustainable and healthy food system transformation is a central pillar of the development strategy of low and middle income countries. The main concerns of policymakers are creating many decent jobs through value addition in domestic food supply chains and mitigating a dietary transition that includes dramatic increases in obesity alongside persisting stunting and micronutrient deficiencies. However, these concerns have not translated into systematic approaches to food system transformation. In the A4NH program on food systems for healthier diets, we've worked with four countries to develop a systematic approach based around the Committee of World Food Security's food system framework. National strategies and plans for food system transformation vary by the stage of economic development. For low and middle income countries, we've used three categories. Um, last slide, please, yes. Traditional, transitioning, and modernizing. For traditional systems, food security remains a priority and efforts to make diets healthier involve addressing micronutrient deficiencies and adding some vegetables, fruits, animal source foods, 
and other diverse foods to diets dominated by staple cereals and roots and tubers. In transitioning and modernizing countries, efforts expand to improve diet quality, promoting healthier foods and minimizing unhealthy foods as overweight, obesity, and associated non-communicable diseases become a major concern. While transitioning and modernizing countries have many similar strategies, transitioning countries struggle most to manage food quality and safety issues. Next slide. In our work with countries, AFRNH researchers have proposed four types of reforms that help ensure food system transformation with inclusive policies and actions. Those reforms further elaborated in the chapter are reverse thinking, where you start with diets, food systems innovations across all components of the food system, enabling policy environment for all actors, and ensuring inclusivity of innovations and reforms. We find two common challenges low and middle income countries face with food system transformation. The first is that with the rapid changes in most countries, decision makers need to put more emphasis on anticipating and planning for rapid future change. The second is that progress on inclusion requires deliberate actions. I would like to provide three examples of how countries are innovating to address their inclusion, to address the inclusion challenges they face. If, next slide, please. AFRNH has been working intensively in Vietnam, which is a great example of a country with a transitioning food system. In Vietnam, diets are well known for including fresh foods, including vegetables and meat. While fresh foods are very nutritious, they have big microbial food system burdens, especially as value chains grow longer. Thus, the current discussion of food system transformation in Vietnam is dominated by food safety. Given the rapid growth in high value export markets, the government of Vietnam pushed for rapid commercialization of supply chains with international food safety standards. This proved difficult to implement as fresh food chains relying on consistent practices and cold chains often failed. Meanwhile, poorer Vietnamese continue to buy, sell, and to trust fresh food from informal markets. The government is adapting its regulatory framework, working with local councils to facilitate food system improvement in informal markets rather than banning them. Uh, next slide. Ethiopia, on the other hand, is an example of a traditional food system that is moving rapidly to transitioning. As in many African countries, Ethiopia is investing in agricultural growth corridors, linking high potential rural districts to growing cities. However, there were many more distant and poorer districts left behind. For these districts, an ambitious productive safety net program has been imp implemented over several phases providing cash transfers to poor households. Given sufficient time, these transfers have had measurable impact in terms of household resilience and food security benefits. However, the uh, nutrition has not improved, so additional nutrition sensitive interventions are being included and tested. Next slide. Malawi is developing inclusion innovations at community level. Malawi is a country where chronic and seasonal food insecurity is very common. The government has worked with development partners to implement, test, and scale two community-based inclusive food programs. The first relies on a community organization, Parents Association, uh, that works with preschool children. An agricultural program with additional food preparation and nutrition education components has provided important diet improvements for the preschoolers and their siblings. A second intervention targeted at household and local markets addresses seasonal famine. If pre-researchers worked with World Food, Gra Food Program to assess food supply demand and markets, 
Households in communities with functioning food markets receive a cash transfer. Those in communities without functioning markets receive food, direct food transfers instead. Both interventions rely on existing community-based institutions. And after successful testing, testing of the interventions through RCTs are being scaled up by the government with finance from the World Bank. These three examples of inclusive food system innovations for healthier diets illustrate options at different stages of food system transformation. Each, in each case, policymakers used a systematic and evidence-based approach. Shared lessons across countries adapted to local co context can speed up food system transformation to ensure that diets become healthier and more inclusive. Thank you. John, thank you very much for your presentation and for sharing examples from three countries around the world. Our next speaker is Laura Zaleski. Laura is a program manager in the Director General's Office at IFPRI, and she will share highlights from the chapter focused on one important marginalized group, and that is women. Laura, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Rajul, for the introduction and the opportunity to participate today, and thanks to everyone who's joining us online. So our chapter in the Global Food Policy Report explores how food systems can be transformed to better include and empower women. And our focus here is not on inclusion per se, but the quality of that inclusion. So how can food systems be transformed to be more empowering and equitable for both women and men? So I'll jump right into the first slide. Uh, first of all, we know that gender intersects with other spheres of vulnerability and identity, such as ethnicity and age and poverty, to impact how women engage in food systems. So young women have different opportunities and constraints than young men or older women and so on. But in general, we know that women are already actively involved in food systems in many roles. So they grow and manage crops, they tend livestock, work in agribusinesses and food retailing, prepare food for their families and much more. But women's contributions to food systems are often not formally recognized and they often face constraints that prevent them from engaging on fair and equitable terms. So for example, women generally have less schooling than men, they control fewer resources, they have less decision-making power, and they can face greater time constraints due to a triple burden of productive, domestic, and community responsibilities. And at the same time, we see that diets are changing and food systems are already transforming uh, in many ways. So as women work outside the home, they are more likely to buy food from markets for their families. And we might ask questions such as, are those markets providing that food using more efficient and sustainable production processes? What kinds of value chains are connecting urban and rural areas? Uh, these kinds of changes offer really exciting new opportunities for women to participate in food systems, but they may also create new barriers and challenges along the way. So building inclusive food systems will require approaches that not only enable women to participate and benefit equally, but also that empower them to make strategic life choices. And here we use the REACH Benefit Empower framework developed by the Gender, Agriculture and Assets Project, GAP2, to think about this. So reaching women as participants doesn't ensure that they will benefit from an agricultural development project, for example. And even if their income increases or their nutrition improves, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are empowered to control that income or choose foods for their households. One example is entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurship is often suggested as a key to empowering poor rural women. Um, and it could be an especially interesting area of opportunity to explore as food systems are changing so rapidly. But evidence from Bangladesh and the Philippines indicates that entrepreneurship may not be empowering for women if it's limited to small household-based enterprises, which typically are not very lucrative and can add to women's workloads. So the benefits of entrepreneurship may only materialize as businesses grow and owners can start hiring more workers and retaining more of the profits. So it's really important that we look at how women are involved in food systems, whether they can engage equitably, and the extent to which they're empowered to make strategic life choices about livelihoods, assets, relationships, and more. 
Now moving to the next slide, what would an inclusive and empowering food system look like? This um, isn't a comprehensive list, obviously, but we want to draw attention to a couple of key areas that need to be addressed to make food systems more equitable. So first, women need to have greater decision-making power and control over resources and assets. When women have limited access to things like credit, land, training, transportation, and technology, that reduces their choices and their ability to engage in more lucrative, um, larger scale activities in, within food systems. One way to address this is by enhancing women's negotiating power vis-a-vis -vis market actors through things like fair contracting or payment schemes. And we give some examples in the chapter of that. Second, women need to have a voice in key processes related to food systems, such as research, and also the context in which food systems are embedded, such as, as political systems. Women's voices have to be part of the agenda setting process. Uh, recognizing their needs and priorities early on in the stages of research and facilitating their engagement in political systems are really important steps towards ensuring that women benefit from the ultimate results. And then third, institutions should support women and consider their needs and preferences in their design. So women's abilities to invest in their land and their businesses and diversify their livelihoods are impacted by a whole range of institutions. And this can be everything from the formal laws and informal systems governing land rights to financial institutions and access to timely information and even educational systems. And financial institutions, for example, hold really great potential for empowering women, but if they're not designed to be accessible and responsive to women's needs, they can actually exacerbate existing gender wealth gaps. Mobile phones are another great example of a technology that can facilitate access to government programs, banking, um, services and information from extension or market updates. But women own and use mobile phones at lower rates than men, so they can actually have less access to information provided that way unless there are deliberate steps taken to improve their digital literacy and access to those technologies. Now, moving to the next slide, I just want to quickly talk about a few examples of steps we can take to build more inclusive and empowering food systems. First, we need to collect more data for both women and men. Uh, women's involvement in food production and processing has been really well studied, um, but there's still some major data gaps around things like the capacities and characteristics of women entering agribusiness, motivations for entering business, um, and more systemic analyses of entire value chains. Then we also want to encourage private sector initiatives, especially for small and medium sized enterprises. The food system is really driven by so, um, so many private sector actors from small to medium to large enterprises. Um, so we know that they're going to play a really key role in making food systems more inclusive. One example is that trade associations and certification initiatives can incorporate standards related to gender equality and women's empowerment. But beyond encouragement and incentives, regulations are also going to have to play a key role to ensure that private sector investments really benefit and empower women rather than exacerbating existing gender gaps. So policymakers will have a very important role to play in creating enabling environments for gender equity. And also having more women in leadership positions in all sectors will help ensure that their perspectives are included at the highest levels of influence. And then as food systems transform and we see new opportunities to make um, them more equitable for women, it's going to be very important that we ensure that women don't lose ground. So we wanna keep an eye out for unintended consequences of food systems transformations, such as increased workloads for women, um, making sure that women have the resources and decision-making power to expand into new market opportunities or production when they wish. And then really crucially, evidence suggests that approaches to empower women must include working with men, both to prevent backlash against women's gains and also to make sure that newly transformed gender roles are sustained. We know that food systems are transforming and in many ways, and as the world faces new challenges from the COVID-19 pandemic to ongoing trends of climate change and demographic shifts, it's going to be really important to ensure that these changes create opportunities for women without putting additional burdens on them. Transforming food systems to support and facilitate women's empowerment benefits not only women, but their families, their communities, and society more broadly. So I'll stop there. 
Laura, thank you so much for your presentation and sharing the key findings and recommendations on how to integrate and include women more fully in food systems. Before I introduce our next speaker, I'd like to remind all of you watching this event around the world, you can submit your brief questions, your brief comments in the chat box. And we encourage you to do that as we will be coming to the Q&A session very soon. Our next speaker is Rob Wass, Director of the Markets, Trade and Institutions Division at IFPRI. And Rob will share key findings from the chapter focused on another important marginalized group, smallholders. Rob, over to you. Thank you, Rajul. Um, as we're currently all concerned about the global health crisis caused by COVID-19, and that it also might cause a food crisis for poor people, um, let's look also beyond the pandemic. It will still hold that the potential for job creation and better incomes along food supply chains is enormous. It holds the key for ending poverty and hunger. If we go to the next slide, how can we leverage this potential? To know how, we first need to understand how food systems are over the world. Four issues here. First, food markets are in South Asia. Urban markets are much of the growth in food demand away from staple crops to more fruits, vegetables, animal products, as well as processed foods. And food supply chains are already adjusting. Second, smallholders are key. They form 85% of all farmers. Many of them are poor. So key question is what can be done that they can reap the benefits of changing food and growing food markets. <clears throat> At the same time, it cannot be only about the smallholders. Unlike often thought, they only produce a modest share of the primary food supply, barely 40%. So solutions for them should be part of a bigger story. Third, a good part of that bigger story lies beyond the farm. Urbanization and changing food demand have already led to the emergence of millions of small, medium-sized enterprises in storage, logistics, transportation, processing, wholesale, and retail, also in the poorest regions. In Africa and South Asia, this middle part of the food supply chain is already making up 50% or more of the agri-food sector. And 50, then they also make up 15 to 20% of gross domestic product in those countries. So lastly, <clears throat> um, this change in the food system, this quiet revolution as some people call it, it seems to be happening outside of the eyesight of policymakers. And being forgotten, the many small and medium scale enterprises in this hidden middle are hampered in doing their business by poor infrastructure, lack of finance and other restrictions that make, them, uh, for, make it difficult for them to compete with supermarket chains and big food companies. As a result, much of the potential for job and incomes is left untapped. So what can be done? Go to the next slide. Let's start with a hit the middle. Running small off-farm agri-food businesses is already highly profitable. In fact, per, per worker income in this part of the food chain is already much higher than farm income and can even pay off more than non-food activity. So businesses are already a multitude in food supply chains in Africa and Asia. Policymakers should see the potential for their growth and further development. So how can policies create a better environment for agri-food <coughs> businesses to thrive and integrate the middle, in the hidden middle of the food supply chain? In the Global Food Policy Report, we recommend three priority areas of support. First, improved infrastructure and access to finance. Evidence shows that if such support is provided by those businesses that operate in and near small and intermediate cities and connect rural producers to urban consumers, then we get the most inclusive impact. Second, there's a need for publicly certified, publicly guaranteed food standards, as well as price incentives that help small and medium 
enterprises in the food supply chain to meet the higher quality and food safety standards of consumers and be able to better compete in domestic markets and also connect the global value chains. Third, our education policies. Basic education is important, but also professional training to improve entrepreneurship, knowledge of information technologies, and as well as of food safety and quality standards. Let's move to the next slide. What does it mean for the smallholders? They're being pushed to change as well with the food demand changes, as well as with the modernization of the middle of the supply chain. To move up the ladder, more is needed than just improving land productivity. In the changing landscape, it's not good enough for smallholders they need to change with changing demand. They'll need to be able to meet higher quality standards and sustainability requirements. If they cannot, they will be left behind. So how can we facilitate that smallholders will gain from the transforming farm systems? Here we propose um, uh, three, um, uh, three priorities. First, land insecurity and land fragmentation are a main obstacle in many poor countries. Hence, better land tenure policies are needed to provide secure ownership, improve access to finance, and overcome limitations to scale of smallholders. Second, um, are policies and regu reg regulations that promote inclusive agribusiness models, such as contract farming or cooperatives. For smallholders, such business models have been shown not only to create economies of scale, but also increase the share of farmers in the value added generated throughout the supply chain. And it works even better if complemented by policies that provide additional incentives uh, for such uh, inclusive models to induce farmers to diversify into higher value crops, adopt climate smart practices, and comply with higher quality standards. Third and lastly, um, to invest in their farms and agribusinesses, smallholders will need to be able to better manage risk against uh, more, uh, market volatility and weather shocks. Social protection and farm insurance tailored to smallholder needs have proven to help them not only manage such risk better, but also facilitate the use of improved inputs uh, and to help them transit to employment in off-farm activities. Let's move to the last slide. The Chinese word for crisis, it links danger and opportunity. The COVID-19 pandemic is testing the resilience of our food systems. It underlines the importance of building better integrated and inclusive value chains. Agricultural policy cannot achieve this. We need to leverage the entire supply chain for the poor in Africa and Asia, I would argue, it can all begin by strengthening the middle, the hidden middle of the supply chain. Thank you. Rob, thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like now to come back to our Director General Leo Swinnon to share some reflections on building inclusive food systems at a time when we are battling the coronavirus pandemic. Over to you, Yo. Thank you again, Rajul, and thank you to each of the speakers who I thought did a great job in the short period of time to basically bring across uh, some important insights and, and key recommendations. Uh, I'm, they actually highlighted a number of recommendations and quite a few policy actions. I am not going to repeat this here. Instead, I'm going to focus on how our report and uh, the role of food systems or the how food systems are affected by the current crisis, the outbreak of COVID, and how that would affect our recommendations. Rob already hinted at the at this last slide, in his last slide, on some of the points I want to make. Food systems around the world are majorly disrupted by COVID-19 outbreak. Okay, now this that means that the threat to food security, food and nutrition security in the world, which is very clearly there, is caused by a very different mechanisms than the last time uh, we had the global food price spike as it caused uh, major impacts, maybe negative, major negative impacts on food systems and on food and nutrition security. 
We know that um, food systems around the world are affected, but the impact, the way they are affected, the way they are influenced or disrupted by COVID-19 is quite different. It differs between commodities, it differs between uh, different uh, geographies, it certainly also differs between rich and poor countries. Now, this is important to understand. Why is that? Because if we want to help the poor address their concerns, we have to do it right. We have to understand well how uh, they are affected by these disrupted food systems and the interaction with the COVID outbreak. One of the factors is that with the economic recession, which is now uh, spreading across the world, the poor will be most heavily affected. And because they spent more of their income on food and nutrition, it will affect food and nutrition security much more for them. A second uh, mechanism is that private value chains are disrupted across the world, but the impact is much stronger in what I refer here as labor intensive food systems rather than capital intensive food systems or value chain systems. And these are typically, so the capital intensive systems are typically characteristic of richer countries, the labor intensive systems are characteristic of poorer countries. Another factor, another aspect of disruption in food systems as a whole is how public programs, which are there to improve um, nutrition, to improve uh, food uh, provision to the poor, how they are affected. And again, of course, the impact is much more important for the poor than for people who can still fully rely on private, uh, uh, private uh, sector income, uh, food. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, what does that imply for our recommendations and policies? Well, to put it in one uh, title, and Rob and I did not coordinate, but we actually have almost the same uh, summary, is that we need inclusive food systems now more than ever. Okay? And again, we have to in, in, uh, address these issues as we are doing today, as we do in the report at the global policy level, but we have to take action at the national level, think about how to implement, particularly because the impact of the disruptions may differ so much between regions, between different levels of economic developments, and even between different types of, of, uh, of food commodities. A very important aspect uh, that is true in general for uh, inclusive food systems, and certainly true today, is the role of social protection programs. They must safeguard food security and the nutrition of the most vulnerable to the extent possible. If we think on some of the longer run uh, issues, uh, they are listed, some of them are listed in the next slide. When we think about how to su uh, support sustainable development, create more resilience than we have today. Here are a number of uh, things that we basically discuss and elaborate on in the report. One is uh, investment in infrastructure, services and rural areas, which is obviously crucial. Um, the empowerment of marginalized people, the protection of their rights, the enhancement of their access to resources, all very important things, as, for example, uh, Laura has already identified in her presentation. Investments in human capital are important in general, but are particularly important also to make them resilient and strong in, uh, for, in the future for development. Uh, I have only, in this very short time, I only have uh, room for identifying or listing a number of these in the report. We do uh, much more and more elaborate. I would like to end now with a slide where I have listed uh, some of the blogs which we have recently put out here at IFPRI, addressing um, the impact that the COVID outbreak has on our food systems and basically also identifying policy recommendations, actions that we could take both at the national level, at the regional level, and at the global, um, global community level. And so here's a number of titles. Some of this initially, most of the blogs were focused on China because that's where the outbreak happened first. Now we are focusing much more at the global level on Africa and on India very recently. So today we had a paper coming out, a new blog coming out, discussing the impacts which are potentially very dramatic in uh, India. We have more coming out in the next week and the next weeks. And so I very much encourage you to take a look at these to uh, basically to get informed about issues that you may be mostly interested in. I will end here. I'll be happy to answer more questions if you have some. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, you, and you have given a great segue to our next event. So a little commercial for that. 
one week from today, same time, we will be having a special event on COVID-19 global and country level implications. So do join us then. However, let me come back here. Thank you to all the speakers. And as you mentioned, we have a number of chapters. I encourage you to read the full report and explore all the accompanying assets at uh, our website, gfpr.ifpri.info. At this moment, we'll move over to the Q&A portion of the program. And as before, I encourage those of you who wish to submit brief questions and comments to do so, typing them into the chat box. And feel free to share your name and institution and country if you wish to do so. I will take questions at a time and may consolidate them as needed. And let me begin with the first question. And I will direct this to you, Laura, and I give a heads up to you and John and Rob that I will come to them in turn. Uh, but let me begin with a question for Laura. Laura, continuing on this COVID-19 theme, the first question that I have for you is, what are the potential implications of COVID-19 pandemic for women's inclusion and empowerment in food systems? Could you comment on that? Thank you. Sure, thanks, Rachel, and it's a great question. And I think as Yo mentioned, there's some real concerns about um, this crisis disproportionately impacting poor and vulnerable groups. Um, and we know that shocks affect men and women in different ways. They can exacerbate gender gaps. Um, there are impacts on assets and consumption and even different needs that men and women have to rebuild after a shock. So I think it will be important that we keep an eye on things um, gendered impacts, including how men and women are differently affected by food insecurity, poverty, livelihood disruptions, um, even things like community restrictions on mobility, lockdowns, um, or changes with um, male migrants returning to communities. How does that affect women's participation in the labor force, their control over income, time, mobility, and things like that. Um, and then also in terms of um, shocks impacts on stress in households and potential impacts for increases in domestic violence, I think we should be keeping an eye on all of that. And then not only in terms of the gendered impacts of the crisis, but then as we're rebuilding after the crisis, I think we need to have a gender lens looking at how do we rebuild food systems in ways that are more um, inclusive and equitable, particularly for women. Laura, thank you so much. Let me take a question that has been submitted online. And this question I will direct to Rob Voss. And this is from Abhilesh Sandhya from Bangladesh. He uh, asks, how does the age of smallholders affect the transformation of food systems or their ability to adapt to changes required in the food systems? Rob, would you like to address that question? Um, yes, of course. Um, uh... But age can be very important um, in driving through just any change uh, when it comes to technology change and so on. So the concern which often is voiced is that with aging farmers around the world, um, that they will be less inclined to adopt new technologies and, and change production from what they've been accustomed to doing uh, for most of their life. Um, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's sometimes thought that um, the numbers have put out, and I used to work at FVO and come up with average numbers, like the average age of farmers is pushing 60. That's not entirely true. Um, farmers in, in particularly in Africa and also large parts of South Asia are still uh, much younger. Um, so that's like also where the opportunity lies to make uh, changes. Uh, and. Um, through education systems and bring them also to, uh, to smallholder farmers through technical assistance uh, to make sure that they can prepare for the changes that are happening in food systems. Uh, but alongside that would need to happen and that yeah, the age doesn't matter, all the other support measures which I mentioned in my presentation should be put in place in order to, um, to, um, to forge uh, the transformation we want and particularly for small Rob, Rob, thank you very much. We have difficulty hearing the last sentence, which we'll pick that up later if needed. Um, let me direct the next question to John McDermott. And John, this question is focusing on the capacity 
of uh, people and institutions within countries to effectively build inclusive food systems. You shared the examples of Vietnam, uh, Ethiopia and Malawi. Would you comment as countries go down the road of transforming their systems, what type of capacities do we need to invest in uh, and where would you see uh, the greatest areas for improving capacity? Any comments on that front? Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so um, in traditional societies, there's really much greater emphasis on rural development, on uh, food, food supply, um, but then building up the infrastructure, building up the practices for better food systems. And the capacity to analyze, because most of the traditional food system countries now, like we described in Ethiopia or Malawi, parts of their food system are rapidly transitioning already. And so people have to anticipate these changes. One of the big places we see capacity gaps are in the transitioning countries. So their food systems are changing dramatically. The food supply chains are getting longer. There's more complex food environments and, and uh, marketing and, and private sector activity. And this really affects things, including food safety, which was the example of Vietnam. And countries are finding it really hard to manage the food safety and food quality capacities in their country. And that's where they need capacity, but they also need to take this inclusive approach and say, what is it in informal or markets for the poor that we can improve upon and not just ban them or outlaw them? There needs to be a kind of evolutionary path to help the poor be included in food systems of different types. John, thank you so much. Let me take the next question, and this is directed to uh, Yo. Uh, and this question comes, Yo, from Dr. Arvind Padi, the country director for India for ICRISAT, who asks, transformation of food systems requires repurposing the legacy of policy incentives. For example, India, the political dynamics in the changing times around COVID-19 may not go for such policy reforms. Do you have any comment on that front, uh, Yo? Whether there is the whether there is appetite for policy reforms in this uh, era, Dr. Padi's question to you. Thank you. Unmute. Um, yes, um, that's a very good comment um, and a very difficult question to answer. I, let me try to answer it in, in general because I am not um, maybe not particularly familiar with the the specific reference uh, policies you referred to in India. Uh, what I know is that uh, things are changing dramatically in India, both in terms of the spread of COVID, but also in terms of the government's response to it. And there is um, and so the response is done both at the federal level and at the state level, and there is significant problems of coordination there, which have uh, a lot of unintended effects on both on the food systems in, in its very many dimensions. In terms of creating a constituency for reforms, for necessary reforms, I think they're just, it's hard to predict. So the first signs are not good, okay? The first signs are that many countries are doing the same thing as what they did in the 2007, 2008 crisis, which was that when they perceive food shortages that may occur, basically close the borders. And the problem is that this is just exacerbating the problem. It's, uh, it's like hoarding, but then at the country level, if you want, right? So you create, you add to the problem of, of potential shortages, even if they may not be there. And so there now all the signals are that many countries, once one country starts, the political, the domestic political economy imperative, the pressure is building up so strong that governments cannot resist doing the same thing, even if their economists or their advisors may advise them that this is not the smartest thing to do. Uh, it may also be, but the shock to the system now is going to be so large, both in terms of the economic effects, the food and the nutrition effects, but also, I think, in political effects. I mean, it may also create an, an, an impact on people that they are willing to basically go with uh, reforms, which otherwise would not be possible because they see, I mean, this is really unprecedented, I think. And also, it may also allow... A room for maneuver for policymakers to do important policy reforms, which otherwise would not be possible. So I think in that, the, the jury is out on that, I think. Thank you. Yo, thank you very much. There's a related question. And that related question is, uh, how much appetite 
do you think they would be? And this is a question John and Rob may also wish to come in. How much appetite is there in a time when there is a massive re, um, um, uh, uh, investments that will need to take place in health systems and in other systems that there'll be appetite to invest in agriculture uh, and in agricultural policies and agricultural po programs at this time? Do you have any comments on that front? And I will ask John and Rob if they, afterwards if they wish to come in. Do you see any appetite for invest changing the investments and scaling up investments for agriculture. Over to you, Joe. Yeah, the, um, well, I think there the question, I mean, the, the, here again, there is obviously a threat and an opportunity, I think at the same time. Let's, let's look at the threat first, which is obvious. I mean, the economic um, recession, which is coming, which is obviously going to affect tax revenues for government next year, the year afterwards. And that will have uh, impacts on basic, in addition to all the spending they're currently doing in terms of supporting incomes of consumers and businesses. I mean, this will have an impact on, on public debts and public budgets in the future. There's no doubt about that. Okay, so that means that the supply of potential funds is less for investment. At the same time, there's going to be a tremendous demand on better and more investments in all kinds of aspects of the health system. So that will compete for these funds. Absolutely true. So that would basically be signaling there will be less funding uh, for uh, agriculture, for example, for investments in agriculture. On the other hand, I mean, I think it will become clear soon that in some areas, uh, particularly, I think, in the poorest countries and the transitioning countries, as, as John explained, and, and also uh, Rob, I mean, that there is it's really important if there will be an, uh, to, to, to be resilient against new outbreaks. And well, John is a specialist on that. He's an epidemiologist. epidemiologist I always struggle over the word. Um, he is, I mean, that there will be future outbreaks again, probably. So we have to be ready for that. And I think, again, it may very well be that policymakers are, if they see what's happening now, that they will be open to actually consider that and to make wise investments rather than basically spending the money on some of the policies that we know today is mostly benefiting some farmers, but be really not the public benefit. So, Thank you, Yo. Thank John, you. do you wish to come in? Yeah, so one of the challenges, of course, is um, how do you nip these kind of huge pandemic disruptions at an earlier stage? Uh, because then that puts less pressure on the food system, less pressure on the health system. Um, so that is one area where I think there, there should be more appetite for investing in, in terms of surveillance, in terms of monitoring, in terms of risky behaviors, etc. Um, my guess is that people will see in this crisis both that food and agriculture and health are basic needs. And so that and how they come together for the welfare, uh, particularly of poor people in, in the traditional and transitioning countries will be very important. So. Yes, there may be a bit more emphasis on health, but I think we can also show how important the food system is to this whole process and to the health and well-being of people. Thank you very much, John. Um, Rob, a quick uh, reflection from you, and I see a lot of questions coming in. So, um, Maybe just, just a quick uh, reflection on, on this. I think I would fully agree this crisis should provide the opportunity, but also the awareness that we need to invest more in food systems, make sure that they're resilient. And I think the awareness is there now. People are worried, can we? Can I buy my foods in, in the shop, in the supermarket, in the market uh, every day, or uh, will prices go up and so on? So the awareness should be there, but um, we also have to be cautious and to pressure uh, policymakers on that throughout in particular, so beyond this crisis, if anything, we've learned from previous disasters is that we're very good when there's a disaster to provide emergency relief, which you might now also get. But then after the disaster has dissipated and we start to repair it, then the uh, preventative action to prevent the next crisis uh, hazards to become a disaster, um, that typically dissipates. So it will be up to not just the policymakers, but also the public in general to push for these changes that we see needed to build a more resilient and inclusive food system. 
Thank you very much, Rob. A question now for Laura, and then I give a heads up again to you that the next question will be directed your way on global policy responses. But Laura, this question has been directed to you, and it is on what role should men play in building food systems that include and empower women? Yeah, I mentioned this briefly at the end of my slides, but it bears repeating. Um, we know that approaches to empowering women have to consider appropriate roles and benefits for men. And that's not only to prevent backlash against women's gains, whether that's in the form of gender-based violence or other retaliation, but really because only focusing on women is a missed opportunity to transform gender roles in ways that are more equitable for everyone in a household or, or community. Um, and I would also reiterate the point I made at the very beginning, which is that vulnerabilities and identities overlap. And so um, men's ethnicity or age or poverty may make them particularly vulnerable in certain contexts. So um, I think as we're looking at making food systems more inclusive for all sorts of different groups, the idea of the reach benefit empowerment framework can be really, really helpful um, in thinking about that for all different groups in terms of how we're um, getting a food system that's really more equitable and empowering for everyone. Laura, thank you very much. I'll take three more questions and ask our speakers to be brief. And there are lots of questions and I appreciate everybody really jumping in. Uh, but let me take the next three questions. First one I will direct to Yo. Uh, and uh, uh, Yo, this question is from Michael Hailu. Uh, he says, my question relates to what are some of the key global policy interventions that could be taken to mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19 on food security and nutrition on the poor? I know you've already reflected on some of this, but if there's any quick response you'd like to give to Michael, other than saying join the event next week, key global policy interventions over to you, Gio. Okay, so uh, join the event next week, I'll start with. The um, yes, so the well, the fact that global stocks are high now is uh, also in response to the fact that we had these huge problems in 2006, 2007, 8 with global stocks being low. So, I mean, that's a good thing that uh, people have and governments have thought about this. The on the restrictions, I mean, I the trade restrictions, I think there, there is certainly uh, something one can try to do, but again. It is uh, normally WTO should play a role there, but it's hard to uh, bring the countries around the table, I think, on, on these things at this point. Uh, certainly in terms of development assistance, development programs, I think there's two major things. One is more on the macroeconomic side where um, actually there's a, a very interesting blog by Eugenio uh, Diaz, who has basically written on, on, on basically the macroeconomic implications that poor countries are much less uh, able, okay, just because of the economic constraints of uh, putting in place the necessary support programs for households, etc. And there, the international community can play a role. Uh, please uh, read this blog, it's, it's really nice. And then on the other hand, I think there's a whole set of development programs, uh, short-term development programs at this point that can be launched. I know the World Bank has set up a special task force to deal with that. I think the first uh, projects are already rolling out in Africa. And so these are definitely things we can do. Yo, thank you so much. I would like to direct the next question to John McDermott. John, this question has been submitted through PEPARD and it uh, is the following. Few countries have developed specific plans for food systems transformation. How should this be supported? Are dietary indicators under the CADEP monitoring helpful? Uh, end of question for you, John. Yeah, so uh, two ways, I think. So the Committee of World Food Security has got a, a good handle and support system on food systems. So they developed the initial framework. All countries are a member of that and there's good sharing of information. And now they're doing kind of voluntary guidelines and consulting with countries in different regions. So join that process as countries and, and learn more from each other. And then on the African continent, African Union and CADAP are really looking at monitoring and evaluation. They've been bringing in nutrition indicators. They've been bringing in a food safety index of late. So they're really thinking much more systematically about food system transformation. So those are encouraging things for countries to join and learn from on the international level. Thank you very much, John. And I'll direct the last question to you, Rob. And this question comes in from Victor Lopez Saavedra. And his question is, what are suggested tools 
to promote and measure advancement towards inclusive value chains. End of question. And Rob, I know we can do entire seminars on this, but perhaps some brief response on suggested tools to promote and measure advancement towards inclusive value chains. Over to you, Rob. Uh, no, thanks for that uh, question. Uh, I think I tried to elaborate on it in my presentation. There's, uh, I, I would say um, in the current development of food systems, the, the key dynamics is taking place in the middle of midstream of the food system. So we should, should start there to create a more integrated value chain and allow like small scale businesses to connect the dots between the different stages of the food supply chain, improve storage space, improve distribution networks. And that will also give bigger opportunities for smallholder farmers to connect to those food systems and gain a higher value added. Um, uh, likewise, if we can also help smallholders to transit, uh, which many of them are still engaged with basic staple crops to also produce um, higher value crops, fruits, vegetables, um, that would all, then also allow them to yield uh, and obtain higher income. So if you move away from the old uh, traditional policy, focusing on productivity increases for farmers and particularly for smallholders, uh, that will not be enough to create inclusive food systems. We need to look across the food chain uh, but start with creating this dynamics from the midstream that then also help smallholders uh, gain more from the, the earned incomes and op em employment opportunities along the food system. Rob, thank you very much. We have received a lot of questions and comments online and truly appreciate everybody taking the time to do so. I will share them with the speakers, but in the interest of time, uh, uh, and we schedule this as a one hour event, I would like to give the speakers a chance to do a quick final takeover messages for all of you. And I'd like to go in the following order. I'd like to ask Rob first, followed by Laura, followed by John, and then Yo to give brief final takeaway messages. Rob, please begin with you. Well, maybe I could start from where I just ended with the answer to the last question, but basically we need resilient and inclusive food systems. This, this health crisis made that very clear. Um, uh, it cannot be that, that we also end up having a food crisis next to uh, the health crisis. So the only way to do that is to build well-integrated, inclusive food systems, because if you have a lot of actors in the food system that have to scramble for their incomes and for the food themselves, then we won't have good functioning systems and then all of us will suffer uh, along the way. So inclusive and resilient food systems are now needed more than ever. I would say that um, food systems are changing, obviously, and there are lots of exciting opportunities, but we must make sure that they don't put additional burdens on women um, and really open up those opportunities for them instead. Um, and making food systems more equitable and empowering benefits everyone, not just women. Yeah, thanks. So this is advice to national policymakers who are looking for decent jobs and healthier diets be systematic and evidence-based, and learn and adapt quickly. Your food systems are changing more rapidly than you can imagine. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I, was, I had prepared some notes here, but they overlap very strongly with what some of the other people have said. I think the, 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 the key point being that the COVID has shown how vulnerable we are we all are, even those who thought we were food and nutrition secure, we are not. And the greater inclusivity in food system is not necessarily a panacea for this or for any other crisis, but it's certainly a critical part of strengthening our resilience, okay? And so the fact that we are in a crisis also offers an opportunity, I think, to come up with new ideas, to invest in the future, to, be, to become more resilient to future uh, shocks. And of course, this is benefiting the poor most of all because they are, uh, so dependent on these things. And uh, so inclusive food systems are more important than ever. 
Thank, Thank you. you very much, Yo. Thank you to everyone who's joining us online to launch our 2020 Global Food Policy Report. A big thank you to all the authors, and there are many of them, only a few of them are presenting here. All the authors have made very important contributions. I strongly encourage you, read the full report, read the synopsis, play with the interactive, read the blog, the many assets on our website. And I'd also like to ask you to join me in thanking our communications team, our IT and facilities who has made production of this virtual event today possible. Please continue the conversation on our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, using the hashtag GFPR2020. Stay well, stay safe, everyone. Join us next week for our special event on COVID-19. Thank you very much.